Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good evening, depending where you are. I'm Marty Murray. I'm Chief Curriculum and Content Architect for Atari Test Prep. And at TTP, I'm super focused on verbal. And one of my favorite things is critical reasoning. So today, we're going to talk about critical reasoning, how to really handle it, how to master this thing, how to not get smoked by those trap choices, and all that good stuff. So without further ado, let's hit it. Now, as we know, there are about 10 critical reasoning questions on your GMAT. So it's a pretty significant part of the verbal, uh, the verbal portion of the test. So you really wanna get these down and you can do it no matter how hard they seem. Critical reasoning is not hard. You just have to do it right. And you the first part of doing critical reasoning correctly, getting it down, is understanding what critical reasoning is. And it's not a it's not a word matching game. It's not a basic uh, I don't know. It's not something we would do, you know, in junior high. It's a fairly sophisticated game that's used to test for uh, you know this is a test for going to graduate school. So what are they testing? What what do they want to know? Well, in business we need vision, right? So critical reasoning is indeed a test of vision. This next thing, second thing it's a test of is use of logic. So, okay, we all, I guess we all get that. And the third part is another important part of running any business is execution. So critical reasoning is a test of vision, use of logic and execution. And if you understand that foundational idea of what we're dealing with here, you'll do pretty well because you know how to handle the critical reasoning questions. You'll have a foundation for understanding what you're about when you're practicing critical reasoning all this is going into improving vision, improving use of logic, and improving your execution. So let's talk about what doesn't work in that case. So there's a lot of things we see people talking about for critical reasoning, uh, and some of this stuff sort of works and sort of doesn't. One of them is eliminating things like eliminating extreme choices or eliminating every choice that uses the word some. These are basic gimmicks. And this is a test of vision, use of logic, and execution. So eliminating extreme choices and say all, all the people did this or every manufacturer did that is not going to really work because it's not, it's not really use of logic. You're just you're trying to apply something that'll get, you know, it'll get you to the correct answer some of the time. But that's not going to get you to your score goal if your score goal is anywhere above the, the low 30s or the upper 20s. Um, Another thing that doesn't work so well that's highly recommended in a lot of circles is pre-thinking. Now, the idea of pre-thinking is that you're going to figure out what the choice is or what the correct answer is or sort of have a pretty good idea of what the correct answer is before you go into the choice. And here's the deal with pre-thinking. It doesn't really work because the chances are that you're not going to think of the correct answer to a hard question. Right? Yeah, once again, pre-thinking might get you to the correct answer to an easy question. But if your score goal is in the upper 30s, the 40s, pre-thinking is going to be pretty tough on you. It uses up a lot of time, and it might lead you to the wrong answer because if you, <laughs> you might see your pre-thought answer to the critical reasoning question, you know, or what you thought is your pre-thought answer among the choices. But it's not. It's incorrect. You thought of something that didn't work. But they, they knew you might think of that, so they came up and then put it there in front of you. So now you've not only wasted your time, you've chosen the wrong choice. So I, I don't recommend pre-thinking uh, pre because it's a gimmick that sort of works, sort of doesn't work, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work, and definitely slows you down. Uh, the th a third kind of gimmick is word matching. This is anything you do where you're looking at a choice, you're looking at the passage. I was talking with someone yesterday, he was looking at a passage, said, well, this is none of this is mentioned in the passage, so I'm sure this is the incorrect choice. None of these, you know, none of this wording matches. Well, I mean, a lot of time the, the correct answer is not going to look anything like the passage because they know this is, you know, they know you're going to be word matching. So they're purposely going to leave the words from the passage out of the correct answer. So if you're word matching, you're there's a good chance you're going to miss the question. All these gimmicks, anything simple like this is what kills people's critical reasoning performance. So if you're having trouble with critical reasoning, or if you're sometimes getting, sometimes I get 75% correct, and sometimes I get 30% correct, 
and I don't know what's going on. A lot of the time, that's because you're trying, you're doing something that somebody said would work, such as word matching, pre-thinking, or eliminating extreme choices that doesn't really work. And, you know, I guess it's worth saying, that's why a lot of people say, well, gosh, I took the test. I felt so confident during the verbal section. And then my score was so low, what happened? Because you were very confident because you were confidently doing things that they were, you know, I'm not saying you, but we, you know, if you see one of those stories, it's a lot of the time what happens is the, con the person is confidently doing things that don't work. We have to do things that work. We got to nail this thing. It's a test of vision, logic, and, uh, and execution. So what does work? The first thing that works, maybe this seems obvious, is reading carefully. I don't, you know, maybe it is obvious, but it's worth mentioning because a lot of time we're trying to get through these questions quickly. We're, you know, and you almost think, well, I know, I, I get this passage. I don't need to read every word. I've seen people literally, you know, say, look, I, I can skip a few words. You know, it gets me through the passage faster. They don't read the last few words of the passage. You got to read carefully. It's going to slow you down so badly if you don't read carefully. You got to read every word because that key detail you skipped is going to be just what causes the correct answer to be correct. And we'll see this in a minute. Or that, you know, that uh, maybe that word that you skipped or, or that, that sentence you didn't read that carefully, that's what tells you the difference between the trap choice, between those last two, those infamous last two choices. So you're not reading carefully. Now you're circling through the choices. So you didn't save any time by not reading carefully. You got to read carefully. Second thing, you know, is paying attention to details. So as we're reading carefully, we're paying attention to those key details, saying, well, gosh, why does it say significantly? Why does it say that this one is bigger than that one? You know, whatever it is, there's some detail, like suspicious. Why is the passage saying this? You're paying attention to those details. So when you get to those choices, you're ready with the information you need. The third thing is we're going to focus on logical implication. And this is really the crux of this thing. It is critical reasoning. We're reasoning. So we want to focus on the reasons. We're focusing on logical implications. We'll talk about this more in a minute. I'm going to show a couple practice questions. But we have to focus on logical implications. And here's what I mean. Let's say uh, the passage says that they're imposing a fee on parking. Okay, that's nice. Well, that has logical implications. It means a few things. You know, we, what are the logical implications of that? Think, you know, if we think it through, we say, okay, they're imposing a fee for parking that didn't used to be there. It probably means that fewer people are going to park. Or maybe it means that people are going to park for less time or more people are going to walk. All of these things are logical implications. More people are going to take the bus. If they say something about a bus and they're increasing parking fees, probably more people are going to take the bus. This is the crux of critical reasoning. So when we're reading an answer choice, we're focusing on the logical implications, not whether it matches words, not whether it seems relevant or irrelevant. I mean, sure, while irrelevant, it's sort of a logical implication, but more importantly, because couple choices can be relevant. So what happens if three choices are relevant? We focus on the logical implications of each choice. And if any of you have studied economics, well, we all remember supply and demand. If the price goes up, demand goes down. If the price goes up, supply goes up. If uh, if they find that apples cure cancer, demand goes up for apples. <laughs> if they find that taking a cruise ship, I don't know, you know, takes three years off your life, demand goes down for cruise ships. All these things have logical implications. And if you're focused on logical implications when you're doing critical reasoning, you're going to kill it. That's what it's all about. Next is making common sense connections. Well, this is how we use our logical implications because you say, gee, they're imposing a parking fee and they want to, you know, how do we strengthen the uh, the idea that more people are going to take the bus? I don't know. You know, wh what's the common sense connection between parking fees and the bus? Well, we make that connection. We look at the logical implications and we make common sense connections. Finally, we have to be super exact. And this is huge too. Uh, I mean, it's not so much, yeah, we have to be exact how we read the passage or read carefully, but I mean, we have to be exact in what we pick up on. For instance, if I'm reading an argument and the conclusion says, when we build this bridge, we're gonna have a lot more, I don't know, tolls. Okay, that's exact. The conclusion is we're gonna get paid a lot, we're gonna have a lot more toll revenue. Now, you know, you read that conclusion, you go, okay, 
th this mayor of you know Xville said that uh, that they're going to build a bridge. It's a good idea. Was that the conclusion? I don't know. It's, it, it, I mean, he might think it's a good idea, but that's not the conclusion. And then when we go to the answer choices, if we're not being exact, they can slip all kinds of stuff by us because he said, well, you know, the conclusion is it's a good idea. I don't know. Then they say something about uh, pollution. Well, that would mean it's not a good idea. So that'll weaken it. But that doesn't say anything about revenue. Or if they say something about traffic, Traffic is a problem, but that doesn't mean it's not going to bring in revenue. So we're looking at, we're looking at, we have to be super exact in everything we do. So let's hit a sample critical reasoning question here and apply this. Stuff. So let, I, I'll give you guys a couple minutes to read this one. and see what you think the correct answer is. And notice as you're doing it, how important it is to be exact with what you're doing. Because if you're not exact, some of these choices are gonna look pretty tempting. So about two minutes. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Looks as if everybody's being exact. <laughs> See a lot of correct answers. Um, so let's let's go through this thing and talk about why and just observe how important it is to be exact and why the fact that you're getting it right indicates you are being exact. Um, so this argument is the, we have, we're looking through this passage first. That's the way I do it. I always go through the passage first rather than the question because the question can be distracting if I go through the passage, through the question first, and then I end up reading the question a second time. So I personally read the question after the passage. The more frequently employees take time to exercise during working hours each week, the fewer sick days they take. Okay, cool. So we have a, a relationship here, a correlation, but the, the, the more frequently employees take time to exercise, the fewer sick days they take. That's pretty interesting. It helps really to look at direction in these questions. So exercise up, sick days down. Okay, even employees who exercise only once a week during working hours take less sick time than those who do not exercise. So once a week up, those, you know, means sick time down. Okay, good. Finally, we come to the conclusion. Therefore, if companies started fitness programs, the absentee rate in those companies would decrease significantly. Okay, interesting. So... Next move here is to go to the uh, the question stem. It says, which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument above? Notice we knew it was an argument. We didn't need to read the question stem to know that we were reading an argument. That's why I think we don't really have to read the question stems, because you can usually tell what the passage is up to without reading the stem. And you pick up on all these details. And some of the details I see are pretty interesting. So let's go back. For me personally, when I get to see it's a weakened 
uh, weakened question, I go to the conclusion because the conclusion is the key here. If we get the conclusion, we're not going to get smoked. If we don't get the conclusion exactly, that's when we get smoked, as I'm going to show you in a minute. Okay, so the conclusion is therefore, that signals the conclusion, as we know, if companies started fitness programs, the absentee rate in those companies would decrease significantly. Okay. So all we're talking about is the absentee rate. We're not talking about anything else. Does it say that people are going to work harder? No. Does it say just the companies, the fitness programs are a good idea? Are they going to make people healthier? No. But if we're not paying super close, exact attention, and I know this question isn't the hardest question. It's not a, the hardest critical reason question ever, but it's, you know, the, the point still stands. Any question works basically the same way. So, and the other thing I see that's kind of interesting, it just says significantly. So that's a signal to me. I'm not going to leave out that because we could just stop the absentee rate and those companies would decrease, but there's a reason for every word. So I'm going to say, it's interesting to say the conclusion is if companies started fitness programs, the absentee rate and those companies would decrease significantly. That's probably going to be important. Okay. So let's go through these choices and see why being super exact when we're looking at the answer choices to a critical reasoning question matters. Uh, looking at choice A, employees who exercise during working hours occasionally fall asleep for short periods of time after the exercise. Now, you might say, well, this is irrelevant. But anyway, why do we know that this isn't the correct answer? Because we paid exact attention to the conclusion. And in this question, the conclusion isn't too hidden. It's not up in the beginning or a short thing. But still, we have to pay, you know, the point still stands. We have to pay exact attention to this conclusion. We know it's about the, the conclusion is the absentee rate would decrease if they started fitness programs. So what if this A choice they even said they fall asleep all day? Well, the conclusion is not that fitness programs are a good idea. So it really doesn't hurt the argument to say that people fall asleep for short periods of time because they still are at work. They're not absent. So their absentee rate could still decrease significantly. So let's skip choice B. A lot of people chose B. Let's go to choice C. Employees who exercise only once a week in their company's fitness program usually also exercise after work. Okay, now this is a pretty tempting choice because you're saying, well, what difference is the fitness program going to make? And uh, I, we have to be exact here. So what was our support for this? Going back up to the passage, we see it says, even employees who exercise only once a week during working hours take less sick time than those to who do not exercise. And the other, the top line says, the more frequently employees take time to exercise during working hours, the fewer sick days they take. So the point is, these, these two lines still support our conclusion. We're being super exact, right? We're not, we're going back and checking the, uh, checking the, the support. So we know that it doesn't matter that they also exercise after work because the point is that working during during working hours day people take less sick time so even you know employees who exercise only once a week in their fitness program are still going to fit into this category because they are working at work i mean they're working during work it's working out during working hours okay now d is an interesting choice and this illustrates why we need to be exact employees who exercise during in, in their company's fitness program use their working time no more product productively then those who do not exercise. Okay, great. Popular choice. Why is it popular? Because it kind of shows that if if we're not exact with a the conclusion, then this uh, then we might we're going to jump on this choice. Wait a minute. These people aren't doing any more work. They're they're working no more product productively. So why would we do this, right? So if we're not being exact, and I know in this question you might have said, well, it's obviously B. Okay. But this illustrates our point. In a harder question, this is going to kill you because if you're not paying attention to the conclusion, they're going to write a choice that looks great. Comp anyway, if we pay attention to the wrong conclusion, if we're not clear that the, the whole point is fitness leads to lower absentee rate, then we might pick this because we're thinking fitness makes things better. And D go, does go against that. D weakens the wrong conclusion. 
And if we're not paying conclusion, you know, paying exact attention to the conclusion, that's how we get wrecked in critical reasoning. The conclusion is king or queen. Okay. You got to get the conclusion exact. E. Employees who exercise during working hours take slightly longer lunch breaks than employees who do not exercise. Once again, if we're looking at the wrong conclusion, we might, and if they, especially if they didn't put the slightly in there, they kind of gave us a little signal to make this easier. Employees who exercise during working hours take longer lunch breaks. Well, wait a minute, that sounds like it's cutting down on their rate, but on their on their amount of work they're doing. But once again, if we're paying attention to this conclusion, we realize that this is weakening the wrong conclusion because we're being so exact, we're seeing the absentee rate is going to decrease if the company starts the fitness program regardless of where they take those lunch breaks. So this, here's what we're going to do. Each one of these choices, rather than just say relevant or irrelevant, we're going to say this weakens the wrong conclusion. What does it do? Okay. And D E weakens the case for the wrong conclusion. So by being exact with the conclusion, we're going to get so many critical reasoning questions right that we didn't we weren't otherwise going to get be super exact with your conclusion and the reason we can see that we've eliminated everything because we were exact with our conclusion and we're going to get to b and say employees who are frequently absent are the least likely to cooperate and remember this word significantly well some employees are going to likely cooperate so they probably are going to decrease the absentee rate a little bit but are they going to decrease it significantly? No, because those employees who are frequently absent are not even going to bother. So even the words significantly matter. And imagine if this, this question were a little harder with, the, you know, some trap choices. And then you'd be like, well, I don't know. Some people, yeah, you know, they uh, some people are going to be frequently absent, but uh, or who are frequently absent aren't going to do it. But other people will. So they're going to decrease because you didn't see if you just left out the words significantly you might not choose choice B on that basis. So that's why we have to read every single word. Okay. Next up. Okay, so now let's see. Okay, let's, we have a few questions. Let's go through them. Okay. If you fall asleep, some people are asking, it's a good question about choice A. If you fall asleep, are you absent? It says for short periods of time. If they fell asleep, and by the way, if you fall asleep, you know, at the office, are you are you literally absent? We have to be so exact with this stuff. Like if I fall asleep in my chair at the office, or, you know, somebody goes in the closet and takes a nap, is that person absent? I mean, in a, I guess in a way he is if he's in the closet, but he's at the office. And also, it does say short periods of time, so we, we can use we can use some common sense here. Uh, in critical reason, we have to use common sense and say, well, this answer choice, it does, you know, it does kind of go sort of against things. But common sense tells us that if somebody falls asleep for a short period of time after he exercises, he's not um, he's not absent, you know. So that was a great question. And it, yeah, and it does bring up the point that we can, this is, someone said to me recently, he said, well, it's kind of like, so it's kind of like having a conversation with my brother about, about what works and what doesn't. Absolutely. So if someone said, you know, you might say to your brother or your friend or your coworker, well, some people might fall asleep after the exercise, they're kind of worn out. And you, you might say, but yeah, that doesn't really wreck my argument. They'll still be at work. They'll be asleep for 10 minutes. Uh, okay, so let's see. And sentence two is the comparison between people who work out during work. Employees are sorry. No, it's between people who do not. That's a good point. Then those who do not exercise. So it's a little, um, it's a little weak. Yeah, it's a little funny. So that that is interesting for uh, for C. Yeah, it's a little interesting for C, but, uh, oh, it's, yeah, so I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> the point still stands that they say the more frequently employees in the first sentence uh, take time to exercise during working hours, the fewer sick days they take. So um, the second sentence is definitely about people who, uh, you know, it's a little funny. It's a little vague. Maybe the question is not perfectly written. But the first sentence is definitely so. The second sentence is about people who do who work exercise only once a week during working hours. 
rather as opposed to people who do not exercise at all i guess it might be a little bit of an oversight the real point the the, the key thing that locks us in for us and makes it clear that uh, c is not correct is it says the more time the more frequently employees take time to exercise during working hours the fewer sick days they take so we can go with that and eliminate a on that basis uh c on that basis okay let's hit this next idea Okay, so I mentioned this a, a little bit before, but um, we're so to master critical reasoning, a lot of time, everyone looks, you know, the first thing we all learn, at least it's one of the first things I learned, is relevant versus irrelevant. Uh, and we tell, in our, t in our videos on TTP, we're constantly saying, out of scope is overplayed and out of date, you know, or in almost none of our explanations, will you ever see the word irrelevant? We really, in the target test prep course, emphasize, you know, the, the idea that thing it's, it's not really we're going to look at what's relevant versus irrelevant. We're going to look at what are the logical implications, right? As, as I said before, what are the logical implications? And the other thing is, what is the com making common sense connections? Okay, so we're going to go through a practice, uh, sample practice question now and look at it through two lenses. We'll look at it through relevant versus irrelevant, but we also have to look at it we're going to look at logical implications and you're going to see the huge difference between what happens if we word match or if we just say in scope, out of scope, you know, and we're trying to say, well, this applies, this looks like the passage and looking for logical implications and common sense connections. So here's the next practice uh, sample practice question. And when you're doing critical reasoning practice, the key thing here is really look at the, you know, look at the logical implications of each choice. So as you're going through this, what are the logical implications of this choice? What are common sense connections can I make? And then we'll go through and do it together. But you're going to see the, how well this works and how this really can keep you out of trouble and get you a high score in critical reasoning. OK, so once again, let's do about two minutes. Okay, a little longer. Okay, let's hit it. Okay, so as we said before, when we're answering these to get our, when we're answering these critical reasoning practice questions, we have to be super exact and read every word of the passage. So let's take a look at this thing. In the 1960s, okay, 
Surveys of Florida's ag alligator population indicated that the population was dwindling rapidly. Okay, so the population was going down. Surveys indicated anyway that it was going down. Hunting alligators was banned. What's the logical implication of banning hunting? Well, the population should recover, or at least that you would think it would stop it from decreasing. Okay. By the early 1990s, the alligator population had recovered and restricted hunting was allowed. So we have a different situation now. Restricted hunting was allowed, whereas before, uh, I guess it wasn't. Anyway, over the course of the 1990s, so this is now this new time frame, reports of alligators appearing on golf courses and lawns increased dramatically. So the reports increased dramatically. Therefore, in spite of whatever hunting, alligator hunting went on, the alligator population must have increased, interesting, significantly once again, over the decade of the 1990s. So let's go to the question stem. Which of the following of true most seriously weakens the argument? So we know we're dealing with a weak in the argument question. Our next step, nail the conclusion, nail it exactly. We want to know what it is. In spite of whatever alligator hunting went on, so in spite, I don't know if that matters or not, but let's keep it in mind, the alligator population must have increased significantly over when? Not the 1960s, not the 1980s, over the 1990s. So if they say something about the 1960s, now we know. It's not going to be our weakener because this is talking about the 1990s. It's so interesting how much... You just don't miss these if you're detailed in this stuff. So how do they support this conclusion? Let's look at that too. Over the course of the 1990s, reports of alligators appearing on golf courses increased. So reports increased. I mean, clear, does that mean the number of alligators increased? There's a lot of ways reports can increase. So let's see what's going on here. Now, if we look at this through the lens of relevant versus irrelevant, Let's go through these choices. The human population of Florida increased significantly during the 1990s. This passage is about alligators, it's about golf courses, it's about hunting, it's about the 1990s. Okay, so this does mention the 1990s, but doesn't mention any of those other things. And a lot of people eliminate choice A on that basis. Okay, so I'm not really sure. Let's say we're not sure what choice A means, but it looks irrelevant. In fact, let's eliminate it. Okay, let's look at choice B. The hunting restrictions applied to commercial as well as private hunters. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. Hunting restrictions, that's what this is about. It's about hunters. Okay, we're going to keep B and see and see if maybe that's correct. Let's go see other choices. The number of sightings of alligators in lakes and swamps in, uh, increased greatly in Florida during the 1990s. Okay, this answer choice C is it, it's interesting. What are the logical implications of the number of sightings of alligators in lakes increasing greatly i mean it certainly looks is this irrelevant no certainly not irrelevant number of sightings increased okay so i think i guess we keep c that could be the correct answer too d throughout the 1990s selling alligator products was more strictly regulated than hunting was well that sounds interesting selling alligator products is more strictly regulated than hunting was yeah probably well the hunting wasn't regulated. that maybe that means the hunting wasn't regulated i don't know okay how about E? Most of the sightings of alligators on golf courses and lawns in the 1990s occurred at which times at which few people were present. Yeah, man. That sounds really relevant because this is about sightings of alligators in the 1990s and people and golf courses and it's perfect. So I'm going to go, you know, if we're just looking at relevant versus irrelevant, E is the big winner. And it sounds suspicious, too. But we have to remember when we're doing critical reasoning, there's always going to be the inf infamous last two choices. The trap choice that sounds right. They're trying to guide us to this. Well, they're not trying to guide us to it, but they put it out there for us. Something that sounds right. This sounds like a weakener. And it sounds relevant. So, of course, they did this. And more than half the people on GMAT Club that have answered this question have answered it incorrectly. Because they're looking at relevant versus irrelevant. Test takers do this all the time. And we're all taught to do it in, in a lot of cases. So, but don't believe it. We have to go beyond relevant versus irrelevant. And let's take a look at this and see what are the logical implications of each of these choices. So E, most of the sightings occurred at times at which few people were present on those golf courses and lawns. Does that really tell us that the alligator population didn't increase? What's the logical implication of that? 
I don't know. I mean, it sort of figures that most sightings were when most people weren't around because alligators are probably scared to be around. Probably stay in the water when there's a lot of people around. So it certainly doesn't tell us that, uh, I don't know, what does it mean? But it sounds suspect. But the logical implications, it doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't mean there are no alligators. It doesn't mean the population didn't increase. I don't know. There, it doesn't really tell us. This could sightings in, could the population increase if the sightings are when few people are around? Yeah. What if they are when a lot of people are around? Does that mean they increased? I don't know. Or didn't increase? What if there were sightings when a lot of people are around? It certainly wouldn't mean that uh, the alligator population had increased. So the logical there's no logical implication of that. So e, even though it seems super relevant, is out. Through, okay, let's look at D. Throughout the 1990s, selling, uh, selling alligator products was more strictly regulated than the hunting was. So this sounds as if maybe the hunting wasn't regulated, but the hunting was still regulated, right? It says we can't, we can't, it says uh, restricted hunting was allowed. We know from the passage that restricted hunting was allowed. It was restricted. This doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean the population didn't increase. Even though hunting wasn't as strictly, we did see, we still have evidence that there were more reports. So, and the fact that selling alligator products is more strictly regulated doesn't mean that we didn't see more alligators on golf courses, right? So the implication is this, have no, this has no logical implications that affect the argument whatsoever. And people still choose it because you're looking at a lot of test takers are looking at relevant versus irrelevant when they're answering these critical reasoning questions. Okay. The number of sightings of alligators in lakes and swamps increased greatly. What are the logical implications if the increased greatly during the 1990s? The logical implications is that the population did increase. So even though this is relevant, it's a strengthener. So you see what we're doing here? This is how you're going to get to a high score on the GMAT, you know. Is by is by is by being a little sophisticated about this. I mean, what we're doing is not particularly hard, but we're not doing just in scope, out of scope. We're not word matching. We're looking at these logical implications, and this is you know this is the way test takers score high on verbal and score and perform high on critical reasoning. Okay, the B the hunting restrictions apply to commercial as well as private hunters. You know, that sounds almost like a strengthener because it's saying, gosh, you know, the uh, the population would increase if the restrictions applied to everybody. But once again, it doesn't really change what the evidence we have. We already know that they appear on golf courses and, 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 and uh, reports are increasing dramatically. So the fact that the hunting restrictions apply to these people, this is kind of the cause. We already know what the effect is, that the reports are higher. So. And we talk a lot about cause and effect in the TTP course and not, you know, and noticing what really affects things and what doesn't. And certainly B just doesn't change what we already know. We have we have an effect and this and so we don't need another cause in this kind of question. OK, finally, the human population in Florida increased significantly during the 1990s. So the two things we're going to do here, we're going to look at logical and uh, logical implications and common sense connections. You know, this is kind of a weird choice because, I don't know, it doesn't seem to, it, it really is pretty, <laughs> it's pretty vague. But if we look at logical implications of the human population increasing, well, if there's more people in Florida, then, uh, you know, all other things being equal, we should have more sightings of alligators, shouldn't we? Because there's just more people around to see them. I mean, you know, there are more golf, and you also, I would think that if there are more people, there are going to be more golf courses. And more lawns. So we have more people, more golf courses, and more lawns. Our, the illogical implications of the human is that those are the logical implications of the human population increase significantly. So what's our common sense connection? Is that when the human population increased significantly, more people would see alligators. Can you believe? And that's so straightforward, right? I mean, it doesn't say hunters, it doesn't say restrictions, it doesn't say alligators, it doesn't say golf courses. So it certainly could be considered out of scope. But if you really think about it, it's straight up right there in your face that this is the correct answer. This totally nails it. So we get this question correct by just looking at logical implications. And this is a question, you know, one of the harder questions around. We're just detail oriented and do that. And that's why we this is why we focus on this in the TTP course 
is because this is what this is what gets you to your you know your critical reasoning score goal. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. So we have some questions here. One question is, uh, my problem with these kind of questions is timing. I don't know how much time I should spend. Okay, there's a few answers to that. One is when, and we're going to talk about that in a minute more, but one is when you're practicing, who cares? You're practicing, you're learning, this is new. You're starting, you're starting to learn, you're, you're training for critical reasoning, you're doing these practice questions to learn. It's kind of like starting a new job. The first day on the job, the people, all the people who have been working there for months are working so much faster than you. If, they're make, if you're making sales calls, you make three sales calls. The guy next to you makes 15 sales calls in the same amount of time because he, you know, you don't even know the way to the mail room. So everything takes you longer, but you're learning. So when you're practicing, take your time. Don't worry about the time. Okay. The next question, is there uh, given our more reports? Yeah, okay. The point is, yeah, the, the point of the argument is that we see more alligators, therefore the population of alligators must have increased. You know, uh, it's not, it's that we see, the, the, what does it say? Reports of alligators increase dramatically. Okay, how is C strengthening? Because it just gives us more, uh, it's not a great strengthener, but it is saying the number of sightings of alligators in lakes and swamps increase greatly. So it gives us more evidence, basically. Doesn't it give us more confidence? Uh, you know, we, we already seen more alligators on golf courses and lawns. And now we also know that we're also seeing them in lakes and swamps more. I mean, that's kind of where they naturally are. Something could be chasing them onto the golf courses or lawns. It could be some other factor, but that's almost the, the purest sign of all is that we're seeing more alligators in lakes and swamps. So that, that definitely gives us more reason to believe the conclusion is correct. Um, okay. So you get the idea. If you, pr if you do these this way, you're going to, you're going to find that you're going to get all, you know, basically all of them correct because you, you're not going to, the whole thing with this is these trap choices versus correct answers. And if you're looking at logical implications, it's saying, what are the logical implications of this? You're not going to fall for the trap choices. You're going to score high on, you know, a GMAT verbal because you're, 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 you're looking very carefully at these logical implications. So let's talk a little bit about how to practice. Okay. Because, uh, you know, I'm sure people, uh, other people are wondering the same thing. As I'm starting to say, practice on time. You know, one guy was having a, recently told me he was having trouble with critical reasoning. And then he started doing much better. And he, it turned out he was spending a half hour on each question. And that's not too much in the beginning. If you need to spend a half hour to see what's going on in a question, do it. Because then you're going through the motions that lead to success. Go through the motions that lead to success. Even if it takes you, somebody told me he's spending an hour and a half on some of the questions. He's going through the motions that lead to success, okay? And if you can get it right in an hour and a half, you can figure out a way to get it right in an hour. And then you can figure out how to get it correct in 20 minutes. And you're going to get correct answers eventually. You know, and, and you're going to and you're going to learn if you can get them. I always tell people if you can get a question correct in 20 minutes, you can learn to get it correct in five. And then if you can get it correct in five, you can get it correct in two. And here's the thing. It works much better to get them correct in 20 minutes and work the time down because you're doing the right thing than it does. And it works much worse to try to get them answer them all in two minutes each and not get them correct. How are you ever going to learn? You're doing them in two minutes each and then getting them incorrect is not going to teach you. Getting them incorrect in two minutes each is not going to teach you to get them correct in two minutes. So start by getting them correct and then work the time down. Uh, second thing, analyze every choice. As you saw, we analyzed every choice. When we went through these questions, we didn't say, well, I don't really like B. I'm pretty sure it's A. A looks correct. I'm going with it. Analyze every choice. And this is great, too, because people end up running out of critical reasoning practice questions. They go through all the TTP questions and they go, gosh, you know, I need more questions. And then they go through oh, a bunch of OG questions and, oh, gosh, I need more questions. Well, a lot of this because they're going through them too fast. Every, every uh, 
every answer choice, you can treat it as, as a little mini question for yourself. Take time with every choice. Make sure you understand why every choice is correct or incorrect. This is great practice. And like, for instance, if you don't know why a choice is incorrect, have you really answered that question? Are you really developing skills? I don't really know why choice C is correct or incorrect, but I don't like it. And I'm pretty sure, you know, that's not, that's not going to get you to a uh, 45 in verbal. That's not going to get you even to a 35 in verbal. you got to know every, you know, analyze every choice and know why it's correct or incorrect. Okay. Choose an and going to this, choose an answer only when you're close to 100% certain. This is when you're practicing, right? I know someone said, well, I start freaking out. Don't worry about it. Don't choose a choice until you're close to 100% certain. Basically, you're sure. A lot of time people guess between the last two choices. Oh, you know, well, I don't know. Well, one of those is a trap. And if you're not learning how to choose between trap choices and correct answers to critical reasoning questions, you're, you know, if you're not spending the time to do that, then how are you going to learn it? The goal is development of skill is our next bullet point, right? We're trying to develop skill here. So that's why we practice on time, analyze every choice, read the passage. You know, I've seen someone just slow down reading the passage, go from like a 50% hit rate. An hour later, she was getting 85% correct because she was just taking more time developing her skill. It's so cool how this works. If you're having trouble with critical reasoning, slow down and say, look, I just have to be super careful and super analytical and see these logical implications and make common sense connections. And I bet I'm going to start getting these right. And you will. It won't be trouble anymore. And you know what? In the beginning, yeah, it's going to take 15, 20 minutes to get the hardest ones correct. Okay, fine. You're getting them correct. It's so cool. You'll see. You know, I see people on TTP going, well, I, you know, the hard ones got me. Oh, it's terrible. You know, <laughs> a lot of people say because our hard critical reasoning questions are meant, they're all upper 40s or mid 40s critical reasoning questions. You're not going to see 10 or 20 of these questions when you take the test. And there's only a couple like that on the OG, but you need the practice, right? So people say, well, gee, you know, I, I had a hard time with the target test prep critical reasoning questions. What's going on? Slow down. They're written. The, the questions on target test prep are written to train you. They're written to make you look and, and, and figure out what the logical implications are. And the correct answers look, they look incorrect. And the incorrect choices all look correct. And people get smoke right and left. You know, So if you want to hit that high GMAT score, take your time and learn to get them right. And you won't be getting that 40% accuracy rate. You'll be getting an 80, 90, 100% accuracy rate because you took the time. It's so cool. It works great. And then you just get better and faster. And, and you're going to kill critical reasoning. So that's pretty much it. If anybody has any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So someone wants to know, do I pay attention to adjectives? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, because adjectives indicate direction, they indicate magnitude, and we need to know those things in order to get these questions correct. Average time for critical reasoning questions on test day. You know, it really depends on you. I would say like a minute and three quarters for an easier one. For an easier question, you know, maybe a minute and a half for a critical reasoning question. And for a harder one, maybe you go over two minutes, even as much as two and a half. Here's the thing. You're going to be answering some of the easier sentence correction and easier critical reasoning questions in well under two minutes. So you're gonna have extra time for the hardest ones. So I would say some, okay, if you want an average time, maybe a minute 45 to two minutes. Uh, the longest time you might wanna spend on a critical reasoning question on the test is probably three. Maybe if you're really cruising on the other questions, four minutes. And a lot of them you'll get done in a minute and a half. Uh, are LSAT and GMAT critical reasoning the same? Not quite. They're not quite the same. Uh, they have somewhat different patterns, some things that uh, the LSAT do some things that the critical reasoning questions on the GMAT don't do. Uh, you know, the, the, your main goal when you're practicing critical reasoning, I would say, though, is to, uh, you, to analyze things. So the LSAT, if you're, if you're stuck, they, you know, they kind of help. But, you know, if you want to maximize the results of your GMAT prep, 
you're better off taking more time with the critical reason, the official GMAT critical reasoning questions and, and good uh, third party questions than you are moving over to the LSAT ones. Tell me, if you take your time and analyze every choice, you're going to get a lot, a lot of mileage out of the, the, official, the uh, available practice questions for the GMAT. Um, yeah, so how do we deal with the passage? So how do we do normally deal with a passage that contains unfamiliar terms, scientific terms? A lot of time I ignore them. I mean, or people, you can ignore them. You know, as long you have the basically where a lot of time we look at these things, like look at this, we'll go back to this passage. A lot of time these things are about increases and decreases. The company starts the fitness program, the absentee rate would decrease. So the more fitness, absentee rate decreases. When, you know, exercise goes up, sick days go down. So, you know, it's you're not necessarily going to need to know all the scientific terms. If you kind of see what they're saying, this is a cause, this is an effect, this is an up, this is a down. And you, you can almost a lot of time make up a word for whatever it says, you know, and say, well, I don't know, it's some kind of medicine. <laughs> It's some kind of process, it's some kind of experiment, and when they do this, this happens. Okay, cool. You know, you don't really need outside uh, knowledge to answer critical reasoning questions. So it's probably a lot of time you can just sort of just make up whatever you think that word means. You know, there's all different, I don't, critique analysis type of questions. I mean, that sounds like a flaw question. Those categories are kind of funny on the ESR. Uh, I would just say, just just keep, you know, whatever kind of questions you're missing, take more time practicing them and do what we're talking about. Look for these logical implications. Look for these common sense connections. Slow down, analyze every choice. And what, whatever kind you're missing, you'll start getting them correct. So, okay, if we don't have any more questions, I guess you get the basic idea here. When you're what, when, you know, obviously, when you're taking a practice test, you got to you got have to answer the uh, the questions timed, and also it helps to do a little time practice when you're uh, when you're working up to your test. You don't want to show up to a practice test or the real test having done all your practice on time, and then you, oh my gosh, I don't have ten minutes to sit here and play with this question, you know. Uh, Okay, some more questions are coming in. If you're aiming for V40, can I skip CR questions that are except? No. <laughs> I mean, maybe if there's just one, I guess you could probably skip it. But I would, you know, if you, you got it, you, just work on all your skills, you know? I mean, okay, fine. Maybe you could get away with skipping the except questions. Conditional logic call, causal arguments, aren't they the same? I mean, so I'm not 100% clear what you're asking. Do you need to do them? You basically handle all these questions the same way like we're talking about. I mean, yes, it, the more you know, the more you understand, you know, like in TTP, we have a whole chapter on cause and effect. And it certainly helps people score higher, but what we're doing is raising consciousness. But, you know, yeah, so definitely if you can learn about causal arguments or conditional arguments or whatever, it's going to help. At the same time, we're to, what we're talking about here today is the foundational, some foundational ways of handling these questions. Any advice if you cannot understand what an answer choice is saying? Yeah, when you're practicing, spend more time reading it. You know, like I always say to people, unconfuse yourself. Take your time. And, you know, I mean, then when you do that when you're practicing, you're developing mental skills to figure things out. And that's, that's what, I mean, if it takes you 10 minutes, like someone said to me the other day, well, I don't understand that sentence. Okay, read it again. You know, get it down, figure it out. Then you're developing that because there's a certain skill to understanding things. You're looking at it. Yeah, you don't understand it the first time. So you read a few words. You go, you read a couple more. You do what you have to do. Maybe you read the whole way to the end and come back to the beginning. It's a skill. You're sorting things out. And the more you do that, the more you fight through these things, the, uh, the better you're going to get. 
at these uh, at, at figuring things out. It's another skill is is understanding sentences you don't understand at first. I uh, cannot agree with the answer choice here. It has to be human population means babies are increasing. More babies are not in. Okay, good question. Interesting question. The human population is increasing. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean babies are increasing. If more people are there. You know, and here's the thing, when we're, when we're weakening an argument, we don't have to destroy the argument. All we want to do is call it into question. And if I say, you know, man, there's a, there are so many more people in Florida now than there used to be, maybe that's why there are more sightings. I mean, we, you know, that doesn't destroy the argument. I mean, maybe there really is, there really are more uh, alligators. But that's certainly like if you see a number on, the, you know, the, the population of Florida is up 200%. You know, I mean, there's a good chance that that means there's more adults and more babies, you know, so you have you have to use just some basic. We don't have to destroy this argument. Yes, it's possible that there are more babies and not more adults. So there's not more people to see the alligators. But the common sense tells us if the population is going up in general, it probably means there's some adults as well. What's the difference between an inference and a conclusion? And how do we find a conclusion in a critical reasoning question? Okay, an inference is, and a conclusion are closely related. An inference is a type of conclusion. In critical reasoning in particular, an inference is a conclusion that like kind of mathematical certainty. And all other conclusions are conclusions that aren't necessarily certain. For instance, the fact that this absentee rate would go down is an uncertain conclusion. It's not a, it's a, it follows logically. The way to find the conclusion is to see what's supported by everything else. I mean, in this question, they gave us therefore. So that kind of points to the conclusion. You can be pretty confident that something that follows therefore is, uh, is the conclusion. But if not, just look for what's supported by everything else. So here, here, even employees exercise only once a week during working hours, take less sick time. Okay, so if companies, if even if it didn't say therefore, it follows from that statement that if companies started fitness programs, the absentee rate would decrease. So the find the conclusion, find the part of the argument that's supported by everything else. Yeah, okay, so back to the alligator question. Yeah, it's true. If the if the alligators, there would be more alligators normally if fewer people around. But the point is the sightings went up in general. Oh, and that's it. Okay, talk about being exact. Let's hit that. Let's. That's a good question. Why is it not the case? I mean, it's pretty interesting. Well, the, the fewer people around, the, the you know, maybe the alligator sightings went up because there were fewer people around. But it doesn't say that. Notice that the, the sightings went up throughout the 1990s and all of the sightings occurred when few people were around. So it's not as if the people disappeared and the, and the sightings increased. The, the, there were people, few people around in the beginning of the 90s and at the end of the 90s. And in both of those times, when few people were around, the sightings increased. You know, I mean, is that clear? You know, there were few people around in the beginning and few people around at the end. And at the end, the sightings were higher. At the beginning, they were lower. So it doesn't have anything. It's not affected by how many people are on the golf course. Uh, some of these questions are getting pretty specific. Uh, confuses the question. Maybe send me an email on that question. That one seems a little so specific for this. Um, at Marty at targettestprep.com. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's true about choice C that the people who work out have to work. But the point is in that question, it could be that they were less sick because they work out after work. But notice the first sentence does say employees take time who the more frequently they take time to exercise during working hours, the fewer sick days they take. So we can go with that as our support for the idea, regardless of what C said, that some who exercise only once a week. 
you know, usually exercise after work. I don't know. Maybe they exercise after work because they exercise at work. We can still, this, the first sentence for sure supports our conclusion regardless of what C said. Okay, folks. Okay, so we're about done. Yeah, as uh, you can reach me at Marty at targettestprep.com or, or hit us on the chat if you have any further questions. It's been fun. Uh, I find critical reasoning a great game. I hope you like it too. When you take the GMAT on your test day, you get into this. <laughs> you know, as you're practicing, get ready to enjoy the, the critical reasoning game on test day and, and be sure to, you know, remember this stuff. We're looking for logical implications. We're, and, and we're looking for common sense connections. We're not going to just look at what's irrelevant or irrelevant. And we're going to nail these things. We really see what's going on. You're going to get better and better at it. And, and the, you're just going to love critical reasoning by the time you take the test. Thank you all. Take care.